Thank you for having me. This is quite impressive, actually, because uh, I'm used to academic conferences, and it's not nearly this uh, cool. Uh, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, thanks to Laura Payne, with whom I uh, collaborated on presenting here. I'm an associate professor in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at the University of Waterloo. And this is on um, digital ICs, security of digital ICs. And this is uh, joint work with uh, some very bright students at Waterloo, Frank Emerson, Mohammed El Masad, and another collaborator, Siddharth Garg, who's not that bright. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I know that the code of conduct is we shouldn't denigrate anyone that's here, but he's not here, so I guess he's fair. <laughs> No, he, he was a colleague at Waterloo, but he chose to move to NYU uh, about a year ago. Okay. I'm going to try to do my best here. So I, I thought I remembered how to project using a Chromebook, but apparently I've forgotten. Okay, so here's the outline. Um, it's two pieces of work. One is an attack, and the other is a defense mechanism. So for some uh, background, what is a digital IC? Or, or what do I mean by computer hardware? I mean dig uh, digital IC. Uh, what is a digital IC? It's physical realization of some logic. That's all it is. There's a cool picture of a modern digital IC, and something it sort of expresses is the complexity of modern ICs. They're very complex. Uh, they're densely packed. Their logic is complex. OK, and a quick uh, rundown on the IC manufacturing and deployment process. So there's usually a design and synthesis phase. Um, there's a prefab testing phase, which is sort of an on-paper testing. Uh, the design is usually sent to a fab facility. Now, one of the modern threat um, scenarios is that there are very few fab facilities in, for example, the US. There's only two companies that actually fabricate ICs in the US. Uh, most devices that we use these days, ICs are fabricated in places that may or may not be friendly. Um, there's certainly some post-fabrication testing that's done, and then the ICs are uh, sent out uh, in field operation. Here's an example of a security issue that uh, was recently in the news, so recently in the last few years. Uh, so a couple of examples, actually. One example is the one that I'm going to discuss the first part in the context of the attack. But the other one was a news story from May 2012 that a security backdoor was found in, the U, uh, in a US military grade chip. It was an FPGA chip uh, made in some country that I don't want to name because I don't want to, you know. Uh, but anyway, um, so I actually gave this uh, version of the stock in the US and they asked me whether that country is Canada. And I said, anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so the thing is, well, the funny story about this is for about a year, uh, for about a few months, uh, three months or so, this, uh, the fab facility in this country took it very seriously. They actually shut down the fab facility, and they were going through a whole audit and things like that to figure out how this happened. And it turns out that the security back door was left in there by design by the company in the US. So I don't know which should be more bothersome. You know, the fact that there's a realistic threat of the fab facility actually you know, putting a backdoor in there at fabrication time or the fact that the designers put it in there because, you know, for convenience. Okay. So the first uh, uh, thing is an attack called ICD camouflaging. Uh, it was presented at a security venue called NDSS earlier this year by Mohammed. And you can see from the title, it's uh, reverse engineering camouflage ICs within minutes, uh, not years. Okay, so here's the threat. Uh, that this stuff addresses. So, you know, we talked about the manufacture of digital ICs uh, follows a process. So you have a design, and the design, the output of the design is something called a, these IC folks called a netlist. And the netlist, you know, if you're familiar with uh, logic gates and things like that, that's what it is. It's, it's a bunch of these logic gates that are connected by wires, realizes some logic. There's a process called uh, synthesization, which results in something called a layout, because you actually have to you know, physically uh, realize this logic. It's then sent for manufacturing or fabrication, uh, which results in a die, and then it's packaged into an IC. So you have an IC that comes out the other end, the top line there. Here's an attack against uh, an IC. It's actually an attack on the intellectual property that many folks see 
in ICs that they design. So when Apple, for example, designs a, an IC, they feel that there's some IP there and they want to protect that. So here's the attack against it, which is the, this bottom part of the picture here in, in pink. An attacker starts with an IC and then basically takes off these various layers, D layers, D layers, the IC using some physical processes and also some chemical processes, and ultimately is able to recover the netlist. And if he or she is able to recover the netlist, then of course the IP has been compromised because that's basically the, the, uh, you know, the, the stuff. So there was this paper in this very good security venue a couple of years ago by these folks on IC camouflaging, and that's where this, uh, this picture is from. I just lifted it off their paper. Um, so they were actually, the, uh, their paper is about how to use uh, a technique called IC camouflaging, which I'll discuss in a second, um, to protect from this attack. So our focus is this kind of attack, this kind of an attacker. And their work actually won one of the uh, best student paper awards at this venue, good for them. Uh, but here comes the bad news for them. Um, okay, so, so what is a proposed solution from this kind of attack, where an, attack take, an attacker takes an IC, delayers it, and is able to recover the uh, netlist? It's something called IP, IP, IC camouflaging, which is marketed commercially. Um, the picture at the top there is, is from a, a, a US patent, and the picture at the bottom is from this paper. So the idea here is the following. Um, when you have a netlist, there are different kinds of gates in it. For example, an AND gate or an XNOR gate and things like that. Typically, the set of gates based on which an IC is realized is limited. It's called a technology library. So the idea uh, behind IC camouflaging is rather than having a typical AND gate or an XNOR gate, it is possible to realize, it turns out it's possible to realize a generic, a generic looking gate which doesn't reveal easily what kind of gate it is. However, if we use this kind of gate in a digital IC, it, it functions as the gate it is intended to be. In this picture below, you, know, you see those, uh, those points where you have numbers. The idea is that this generic gate can be used to realize any of 16 different gates. And how is that done? Well, there are these little connectors inside a gate that are not fused. So by not fusing certain connectors, one gets, for example, the functionality of AND as opposed to OR, things like that. And it turns out, or we believe, that in the delayering attack of an attacker, uh, he or she is unable to delayer it to the granularity that uh, they're able to determine what kind of gate it is. The whole idea, so the whole idea, the defense mechanism that is proposed is don't use the customary gates, such as XNOR or AND or whatever, but use this generic gate, which you can customize to those particular gates that you want, so that uh, your circuit is resistant to the delayering -layer, de attack. So if one does indeed adopt this defense mechanism, what's our uh, situation with regards to attacker versus defender? Well, here's the situation. The defender has an original circuit, for example, the circuit to the left. Um, you know, it's got, uh, the, the gate at the top there is a, is a NAND gate. It's, it's an AND gate with a NOT stuck at the end of it. The gate at the bottom is a, is a NOR gate, and the, you know, there's another NAND gate to, to your right. What the defender does is, defender says, okay, I wanna hide the circuit. Uh, so he picks, let's say, the, the two gates to your left as the one to hide, and replaces them with this sort of generic gate. And now the attacker who, uh, you know, the attacker you know, goes to Radio Shack or whatever, buys the IC, and is also able to maybe buys two copies of the IC. One of them, um, he or she delayers, and is able to see the picture to your right, which is that he's able to see that it's, uh, you know, a couple of camouflage gates that are connected to a, a NAND gate. And of course, the attacker also has the other copy of the IC, which he or she has not damaged, and so can, you know, get that IC to function, meaning give inputs to the IC and uh, observe the outputs. So this is sort of the, uh, characterizes the power of the attacker and, and what, what the defender does. So the thing is, excellent, if, if we believe, if one believes that IC camouflaging, which is replacing these gates with these generic gates has any security value, then what you should do, if you care to protect the intellectual property in your IC, 
is to replace every gate with this generic kind of gate, right? But that comes with a cost. So the thing is, it turns out that uh, the generic gate has a large footprint. IC designers, it ca uh, turns out, care about things like area overhead because you don't want the IC to be too large because then it's not going to fit inside your mobile phone, right? There's a form factor issue there. There's also the power issue, which is very, very important. So it turns out that the, this generic gate has uh, much more power consumption than the regular gate it's intended to be. So now we have a we have a very natural trade-off between security and and uh, and um, you know cost, which is that uh, you know we want to get the maximum security, but at the same time we don't want to incur too much cost. So the main claim in this in this award-winning work was it they uh, you know they claim to have discovered that by only camouflaging a few gates, it is possible to push the attacker's difficulty to thousands of years. So this is the central contribution of what they did. And this certainly seems to validate the commercial selling, sale of um, IC camouflaging, which many companies engage in. So of course, there's a question as to which gates, you know, how, how does their technique work? I'm going to skip that here, but basically their ideas come from uh, IC testing, where you know, if you have an IC with, I don't know, 140 bit input, which is not considered a large IC by modern standards, it's, it's impossible to practically test it exhaustively because there's two to the 140 possible inputs, input patterns, and there's just no way that that's being tested exhaustively. So what I see uh, testers have evolved is ways of figuring out what tests are most meaningful. And they do this by some processes called uh, sensitization and justification and things like that. What they do is they want to tease out the test cases that are the most meaningful. And really, the, the, the way these folks select the gates that uh, they want to camouflage is exactly using these kind of IC testing kind of mindsets. So I'm going to skip it here. But basically, they end up with uh, a, a something what they call non-resolvable gates uh, to make the attacker's job hard. The, the idea is that these, these gates, these non-resolvable gates, are sort of dependent on each other. So for example, the outputs of these two gates feed into a common gate, which then, goes, uh, which then is the output of the circuit. And therefore, these two gates are non-resolvable. This is their, their mindset. So what they claim is in this simple digital circuit where the attacker knows that these camouflage gates are one of three types, uh, the, the claim is that the attacker must try all nine possibilities, three times three possibilities. You have two gates, you have three possibilities for each, the total number of possibilities is nine. So ideally, you know, we would have the attacker have to exercise all nine possibilities before he or she is able to figure out which, which uh, gates these are. And, and uh, what they observe is that you know, benchmark circuits, circuits uh, that are used to evaluate things in the IC world, have a high density of these non-resolvable gates. So for example, a high enough density. So for example, uh, you know, one of the benchmark ICs has 63 of these gates that are connected in what's called a clique. Um, and that's only about 2.5% of the total gates in the circuit. But 63 gates is a lot. If your technology library is three gates each, that's three to the 63 different possibilities for an attacker, potentially, right? Okay, so this is their mindset. So what was our attack? Well, basically, we started with this simple example that they had. And we observed that the number of inputs an attacker has to exercise on this IC is not nine. It's at most three. So for example, if the attacker, you know, um, using the IC that was not damaged, injects 0, 0, 0, 0 as the input, he's able to immediately eliminate five of the nine possibilities as realistic possibilities for the two gates that are camouflaged. And it turns out that with only three, three uh, input patterns, he or she is able to, you know, uh, zero, narrow it down to exactly the gates that are possible. This is just from observing the outputs of the uh, of the, um, the IC. So this immediately undermines the claim that this worst case of nine is not uh, the real case for, for, uh, for ICs. 
So we evolved a different uh, metric for assessing the goodness of IC camouflaging, which we call discriminating input patterns. I'll skip the, I'll skip the technical details, and then we, and then we uh, evolved a uh, attack suite to at attack this thing. There were, there were basically two key observations here. One of them was the um, observation that these discriminating set of input patterns is a more meaningful metric than the one the IC camouflaging folks use. The other one was uh, insights from computational complexity, um, which also I, I fear may not be great for this audience, so we'll skip that as well. The only thing I'll tell you is that, uh, so we have oracles for, this is not Oracle the company, but Oracle is something that gives you the right answer of, uh, if, you pose a, if you pose a question. The only thing I'll tell you from this attack suite that somebody pointed out to me is that the oracle that is modeled as a woman is doing a lot more work than the oracle that's modeled as a man. So that was pointed out as uh, bad. So I, I didn't even think of it, so that tells you something about my <laughs> innate sexism. But anyway, um, right, and then we, we were able to uh, build these oracles in, uh, realistically using a constraint solver. If you're at all interested in any of this, all the software, I'm happy to send you. Um, I believe strongly in open source, open everything as a researcher. Okay, so let me go to the cool stuff. Um, our results were shocking, shockingly good for us, shockingly bad for them. This picture is not a scale. So this is what they claimed for these benchmark ICs, which are down here. So they, they have these strange names like C5315, whatever. So the thing is, they claim that, well, you know, if we choose the ICs to be camouflaged using our technique, this technique of choosing non-resolvable gates, then it's going to take an attacker 10 to the 13 years to break, to, to discover all the camouflage gates. But using our tool chain, you can actually break that within seconds. Uh, <laughs> And so we, we also tried a different technique, you know, because their technique is intended to be smart, right? It, it goes and finds these non-resolvable gates. But we said, okay, what if you just choose the same number of gates uniformly at random? How well does our attack work? Well, it turns out that the uniformly random approach is pretty darn good compared to their technique. So this kind of explains the title of the paper, right? So you can, uh, you know, and then, and then we did a lot of other stuff. So for example, we found out that the discriminating set size is quite small. So even if you have an IC with 140, d 140 bit input, which is 240, two to the 140 different possibilities, the number of inputs to, to distinguish those camouflage gates is only around 50, which is a small fraction of the different possible inputs, right? So if you were smart enough to be able to narrow down to that 50, you are a powerful attacker. Um, so anyway, so I'll skip the rest of the stuff, but uh, there's a, we have a bunch of results on it. So here's, of course, the takeaway here, I mean, which is this, I think to this audience, this is preaching to the choir. But this is, a, to us, this is a strong caution for IC designers and, you know, uh, appealing claims on lower bound for attacker, of course, need to be better carefully, right? I mean, if somebody was to walk into your shop and says, well, here's a, security technique and it's going to take the attacker 10 to the 13 years to break this thing, my, I'm gonna guess that you laugh, if, right? But it turns out that in the research community, not only did they not laugh, they gave an award. <laughs> the, <laughs> so I can tell you that when we sent our paper the following year to that same venue, it was rejected. <laughs> it's an honest truth. Then we sent it to another venue, which is also elite or whatever, but, and, and then it was accepted, right? So anyway, so something about the research community there. Okay, so let me go to something more constructive. So these slides are gonna be, I'm happy to share them, right? However b side shares them. So let me go to, well, an award-winning paper from our side. Nobody has broken this yet, and I'm pretty confident that nobody will. That may sound immodest, but there's a technical reason for it, so I'll tell you. Okay, so this is Frank's work, uh, defense mechanism for a slightly different kind of attack. So just to recap on the manufacturing process, you know, we have a design step, uh, and the output of a design step uh, is a design, and these hardware folks, you know, they use something, they, they, they use their own languages. Um, I think HDL stands for uh, 
hardware description language. Uh, the, one can synthesize a, um, an IC from this. Okay, so here's our threat model, uh, which is the one that US military chip thing relates to. You may have the IC designed in a friendly country uh, and then sent to an external sent to an external foundry for fabrication. So the uh, person that's depicted in red is a potential attacker at the external foundry. And the fear is that this person may be able to inject some malicious circuitry in the, in the manufacturing process. So what ends up happening is that we get as output a bunch of defective ICs. Of course, from the attacker standpoint, the ICs have to be able to pass the post-fab testing. I mean, if, if the fact that there's a um, malicious circuitry in the IC is detected in the post-fab testing, that's bad for the attacker. But it turns out that there are attacks that uh, can pass this. I mean, researchers have discovered attacks. We don't know in practice what's going on. We have no idea. Um, so some people think of um, threats to digital ICs as sort of a more futuristic problem. Uh, I, I really don't know what the ground reality is. Okay, so uh, here's a, an example. This is a full adder circuit which adds bits A and B uh, with a carry in bit, C in. And let's say the um, attacker wants to insert that gate M, uh, which is a malicious gate. So he or she inserts a, you know, a trigger wire, T, it's an input wire, uh, and a malicious gate. And what happens is that, you know, this, this, it turns out that uh, depending on the value of the trigger, the insertion of this malicious gate can affect the output of the circuit. This is exactly what the attacker wants, right? This is a particular kind of a trigger. Um, hardware security folks, they broadly classify triggers into two. One is a data-based trigger, such as this one. Um, a trigger is, of course, applied when the IC is deployed. So while your computer is running, it's been running for a year, or your phone or whatever, somehow this input wire T gets fed with the right bit, and bang, your phone explodes or whatever it does. Um, uh, the other one is a time-based trigger, which is that the attacker somehow inserts circuitry to say, okay, a year from now, all the phones will blink 12. That's, say again? That's possible? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, you're asking? Or? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, I think people have mounted this attack on um, on um, pages, like in the in a, a generation before, right? These kind of attacks. Are, okay, uh, yeah, so just pointing out here that if the trigger wire is set to one, then the carry out bit's value is changed. Okay? So here's our uh, solution. What we're gonna do is, we're gonna, uh, exploit a couple of things. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna ex uh, uh, obfuscate the circuit by removing some information. In particular, we're gonna remove wires. So you see here that um, the, you, we have the original design at the top, and the design, the obfuscated circuit at the bottom has some wires missing. Now obviously, if we fabricate that circuit at the bottom, it's not gonna work, because you need the wires to actually communicate the bits, right? So that, um, but, the, but the point behind circuit obfuscation is, by the way, these labels on the gates mean nothing. So in the design, you know, the, these uh, gates are unlabeled. We can think of it that way. Uh, we just, uh, we just I just label it in these slides so I can refer to them. Um, so the point here is if you look at, in the obfuscated circuit, if you look at gates W and V, they're both AND gates. And what we want to do is we want to confuse an attacker who's sitting in the foundry and we want it to be difficult for him to be able to say, well, which, which gate is this one? Is this the gate two, which is an AND gate, or is this the gate four, which is also an AND gate? So that's kind of the, the, the strategy behind obfuscation here. What about the missing wires? Well, it turns out that there's this technology called uh, 3D IC technology. Uh, the IC, which we customarily think of as a two-dimensional thing, it can actu actually be three-dimensional, meaning you can uh, have multiple layers of um, ICs. Uh, and now, the, so in our case, what we're gonna do is the wires that are missing 
that we have taken away, we're going to implement in this higher tier, in a different tier. And there's going to be the, you know, we have to have a way of actually having these wires in a different tier take effect in the actual circuit. Now, why is it that we choose to lift wires and not gates? Well, the thing is, wires are just metal. And manufacturing a tier of an IC with only wires is cheap. It's cheaper than having gates, which re requires silicon. So the whole idea is that, well, if you can get the uh, metal-only plane to be manufactured, let's say, in a trusted facility, you can send the expensive one, which is the one that has silicon as well, to the untrusted facility. And that's an obfuscated circuit. So that's the whole idea. Uh, now, it turns out that 3D uh, IC technology is pragmatic. So Xilinx, the uh, Xilinx XPGA uses it. But it's not really been used for security, as far as we know. It's been used for uh, scalability, scaling uh, the FPGA. OK, so to revisit uh, what we're going to do, we have the design of the IC. We're going to partition it. Um, we're going to have the obfuscated IC. And we're going to have uh, some wires that are removed from it. Uh, they're going to be manufactured in different places that don't collude. Then what we're going to do is we're going to bring them together in a layout. Right? And, and basically, we're going to you know, bond these two layers together at the very end. So the green ones are uh, the things that are done in a trusted facility. And the things that are not green are the things that are done in a potentially malicious facility. OK, so in our case, we even assume that the attacker has a colluder at the design house who communicates to him or her the design of the IC. So the attacker has access to the design of the IC and also has access to the IC that has uh, been sent for fabrication, the uh, design of the IC. This is the obfuscated one, the one that's missing wires. Um, so presumably, what the attacker is trying to do is map gates from the um, one that's been sent for manufacture to the one that's been designed. And the point here is what we're trying to do is maximize the confusion there. So if there's a gate in the um, one that's sent for manufacture, what we want to do is we want to ensure that there are several gates in the design to which it can map. Uh, and this is our notion of security. And the reason I was immodest earlier with regards to nobody being able to break this is that this notion of security is what is called, uh, gives you what is called unconditional security, meaning there exists no algorithm that can break this because we ensure that, you know, when I say this gate may map to any of these five gates, the probability with which it can map to any of these five gates is equal. So with a one over five chance, it can map to any of these five gates. And that's unconditionally true. So there's no, uh, you know, there's no algorithm that can, that can uh, change this. Um, OK, so what we did is we empirically evaluated this thing. And we had a mix of good news and bad news uh, for IC designers. So it turns out that in the IC world, before security came in, they, they have really pushed the envelope to the max. So you know, if I was to bring in a technique that affected the area overhead by, I don't know, 1%, they would freak out. That's unacceptable. If I was to bring in a technique that affected the power overhead by 0.5%, that's unacceptable. So they feel that these things have become so awesome and so good, and you know, they're so sensitive. There is a big question as to how much cost they're willing to absorb for security. So that's a, to me, that's a, you know, on the human side, that's a huge thing that's kind of waiting to happen in the IC world. Um, do you have a question? Oh, okay, he's just stretching. Um, okay, so the thing is, if you if you see this uh, picture, the maximum security that we were able to achieve in this benchmark circuit is about 50. Uh, and it's very easy to reason about why it's the maximum is about uh, 50. Um, it's basically that if you look at the different kinds of gates and you take the, uh, the one which has the minimum number of instances, it's 50. And the point is we're, we're checking what is the cost, which is the number of wires that we had to remove, we had to lift, to get a certain level of security. That's what this graph shows. And what this is saying is that even to get any security, which is to have a gate be confused with at least two gates, we had to remove 50% of the edges. We had to lift 50% of the edges. So this is kind of already, if, if you're an IC designer, it's likely seeming unpalatable. 
Uh, I'm going to skip this part about layout randomization uh, and get to the costs. So if you look at the delay and power costs, uh, then we have about a 2x factor from our technique that we've used uh, from lifting these wires to get uh, security. So again, the, the big question is, you know, in the world of ICs, if we go and present to them a, a security technique that we say, well, it works, but it's unconditionally secure, but it's going to consume double the power. What will their reaction be? I don't know. So I talked to a researcher in uh, digital ICs, and uh, he, he's actually at MIT, and he told me, well, you know, if it's security, depending on your customer, they will pay whatever it takes. So his view is that if you go to the US government, they don't even care about 10x overhead. They'll say, fine. I mean, if you're if you able to show me that it's secure, they're willing to absorb the cost. But of course, our issue is, you know, if you're talking about us as consumers that use mobile phones, and then I tell you, well, you know, I'm going to give you a secure phone, but it's going to be double the size, you know, and it's going to run half as fast, I don't know. <laughs> it's probably going to be unacceptable. OK. Uh, yeah, there's something slightly wonkish here, which is about the, um, which is about the uh, length of the wires uh, once we lift them and we have to put them in a different tier. You'll see that the green bars look a little bit like a triangle. So for those of you that uh, care, the reason for this is that um, this suggests that there's no correlation between where a gate is placed in the circuit and where it is in the design, like whether it's connected to another gate, sorry. Because the convolution of uh, two random distributions is, is, a, is a triangle distribution. And the IC is a two-dimensional thing, right? OK, so we vetted this thing using um, a, a hardware implementation of DES, which is known to have a fault. Uh, in the 14th round, you know, there's a fault in the least significant byte, which reveals a secret key. And we found out that we can secure this. Um, I think we were able to give it like 255. The level of security was 255 using our metric by lifting only 13% of the wires. Um, OK. Uh, and then there's some, a lot of related work, especially in social networks. You know, so in, in the context of social networks, people have done a lot of work where, for example, let's say that Net, um, Netflix releases its data and says, OK, all our data is public. And it, it's kind of a social network. Actually, let's take Twitter and um, Facebook as examples. Let's say one of them releases their entire social network data. And the other one wants to keep it secret. One of the attacks that people have talked about is, OK, can I use this public information to uh, unmask you in the private one? So in other words, just by seeing that you voted for Justin Trudeau here, or whatever. And 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 uh, you know and the fact that you have Alice and Bob as friends, am I able to identify you in this one? And of course, if I am able to identify you in this one, I might get extra information about you. For example, the fact that you really like Mad Max, which would be really bad, uh, something like that. Uh, no, it was a cool movie. Uh, okay. So that's uh, that's uh, some overview. I'll leave you with uh, this slide is a bit dated, but it's a fun slide. So here's what the University of Waterloo did a few years ago. I think anybody who are here who graduated might know about this more than me. Uh, uh, Waterloo had this somewhat dour academic logo. <laughs> this is to the left. And they hired this very expensive marketing person. And this person came in and said, no, no, no. The Waterloo is an entrepreneurial university. We need to jazz things up. So we're going to have this like disco Bee Gees kind of logo to the right. <laughs> And uh, it didn't go over so well. <laughs> so they quietly went back. <laughs> so now if you, you know, the logo's back. All right, thanks, thanks for your time. Well, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I mean, you know, I, I can conjecture. I mean, I, uh, I, I do know some folks at Intel, but I'm going to try and not try and blank that information out of my mind. Um, you know, these, it's like I was saying, I see companies, for them, telling them that there's a cost of whatever, even like 5%, that's unacceptable. I don't know if it's fair to blame them or we should blame ourselves as consumers. I don't know what, what the problem is. I'm going to conjecture that they're going to blame it on the consumers, you know, passing on the cost kind of thing. So, you know, McAfee has a long history and a very good understanding of the reality in security, right? So I can imagine those folks speaking truth to power there. And I, I'm, I'm going to guess. I have no idea. It's, uh, I'm going to guess that if that happened, it was probably unpalatable to a company like Intel, which is a long history in IC, right? That, that's a guess. Right. Right, so that's, that's actually a good question. One of the first things we say in one of these papers, and others say it too in the context of hardware security, and these, okay, so just a quick uh, comment on the researcher space in security. I mean, there's a bit of a balkanization there. There are folks like me that have a background in algorithms and software stuff, and we're coming into hardware security, and there's these sort of more traditional IC folks who are working in hardware security. What what we say is, uh, actually, what all of us say is that, you know, if the security of the hardware is compromised, there's pretty much nothing you can do in software. Because some of the attacks that, uh, so at the University of Cambridge, they actually evolved a, um, a, a hardware fingerprinting defense. They, and they started a company promptly. They published their paper and they started a company and then everything became secret, right? I mean, no, now nothing, we can't talk to them, right? They're no longer researchers, they're in it to make money, which is good for them. But the thing is, um, they supposedly have a few attacks that they are aware of in-house that are very, very powerful on digital ICs. And they are the ones that actually found this um, backdoor of the military-grade chip by doing IC fingerprinting. MI5 or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I don't feel that just by having two layers it does. I feel like it's, uh, I mean, the innovative thing here that we claim is that the reason we have the second layer, or, or we, we leverage the second layer for security, once you do that, yes. I mean, I don't know if this, I don't know if sticking a probe, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about the hardware stuff. I mean, Siddharth is the one to ask. He's the IC guy. I'm more of the security <coughs> algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Why do you say that? So the, so the comment is that, uh, right, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a good question. So the uh, yeah. Um, so the thing is, um, firstly, there was a a claim that security via obfuscation doesn't work. Now the thing is I wouldn't read too much into the word I use. I use obfuscation. I can use a fancier term. But, uh, but you're right. Um, given that the point is, okay, the attacker knows that there's only these five possibilities or 10 possibilities, he or she can do trial by error. So that's true. So that's where I should have mentioned the context. So if you're talking about an attacker that's in the foundry, it's not as though this person has a lot of chances. Because if you get found out, like the military grade chip, the back door being found out, it's a huge event. I mean, the, the facility was shut down for three months and they were scrubbing the whole thing and interviewing the staff and things like that, right? So the point is that e I would argue that uh, even with one in five kind of thing, it's not like in the software world where I sit at home and mount an offline attack where I can recompile my stuff and run it for months and things like that. So that there is that advantage in, in the um, hardware world. 
which is that fabrication is a big deal. It's not like us compiling software on the privacy of our own home and having you know bugs that we fix trivially and all this stuff. It's a quite a different world, right? Where fabrication is an expensive process. You don't have a lot of, you know, as an attacker of the fab facility, you don't have a lot of choices to do trial and error in the manner that you describe. Uh, I think that hand went up first. Yes, sir. Okay, so I, right, well, okay. Yes, yes, well, I mean, so I think, uh, let's take uh, this picture. I think it's the one I was talking about. So, well, what happened is the following, just a quick, so we, we, we tried our attack on their technique of smartly selecting the gates to camouflage. And we were shocked by how effective our attack was. Because, you know, on the one hand, you have a claim that it's gonna take 10 to the 41 years, and our attack works in 2,000 seconds, something like that, right? So then we just casually wanted to ask, what if, we, what if we randomly choose the gates to camouflage, and we notice that it's not that much different from their intelligent way? It is counterintuitive, but maybe not, because it's just suggesting that, you know, just because somebody has something that they say or claims to be intelligent, is not necessarily intelligent. Might as well just do the dumb thing and you're gonna get the same thing. It's like me standing up here and telling you that I'm brilliant. I mean, you shouldn't believe me, right? I mean, like, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, they, they, they thought it was intelligent and I, I, I sympathize with them, but it turns out it's not. And this is quite common in security, we know this, right? I remember back when, uh, you know, many, many people here work in network security, you know, uh, uh, choosing the client port randomly, right? This is a common technique that's used. Because for example, uh, attacks against DNS, they exploit the predictability of port numbers. But it's been shown that choosing it uniformly at random is actually not that good. So here's an example of a smart technique that we thought is smart, but actually is highly susceptible. Because it turns out that if you, uh, do a convolution of these uniform distributions, you get a very kind of almost deterministic kind of a thing. So uh, yeah, I would just say that before we uh, label, especially in security, before we label a technique as intelligent, we should probably be very careful. I, mean, that's, uh, I think there was another, yes. So if you look at the graph, it looks like it's actually good. The attack is better against this larger group of yeah. different sites. Yes, and yeah. if you look at the more advanced yeah. attackers, it's like, oh, they're it's, it's not that smart. I mean, that's it, right? I mean, they, so I, I, okay, the only explanation I have is that I feel that their mindset is rooted in IC testing. And of course, testing is typically geared towards uh, random errors, right? It's not geared towards malicious things. And, and that mindset just doesn't work in security. Like, I mean, if you, uh, I mean, there's many people who work in software testing that try to apply those techniques for security. I would argue that, you know, if I was to abstract from this, we should be very cautious before we believe them also. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if this, oh yeah, let me go to him first, yeah, yes sir. No, oh, uh, de-camouflage or do you mean our defense mechanism? Uh, so I think you're referring to our defense mechanism, right? This one over here? Something like this, when we obfuscate? Right. The answer is no. So the, 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 picture, the, the picture up there is exactly, you can think of it as the design, whatever, hardware description language. And the reason is that, you know, it's very simple. Um, if you look at the two AND gates down here, I mean, what, what do you see about them? You see that they both feed into an R gate Y. Now, if I, now there's, the location might reveal something. The location, the fact that V is over there and W is over there, right? But we actually do uh, the randomization of that. That's actually a natural thing that happens in the IC design process because what happens with these um, in the um, tool chain is that the because the um, um, the layout software is intended to minimize the area and the power overhead. Th this randomization happens naturally. So imagine that the layout of that thing at the bottom was randomized and you couldn't get any information regarding that. The point is, 
I don't know whether the gate two from the design is W or V. There is no information here that tells me that. That's the point. So coming into the design from the design. Correct. Into the Correct. The exactly. That's exactly the yeah. That's exactly the notion of security. Yeah. Uh, I think this gentleman. Oh, okay. Uh, should I go to someone else? Oh, all right. So maybe one of the yes. Was the price? <laughs> I, I didn't know that there was a price. I assumed it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> didn't make. I would have had to cough up fifty bucks for that. Uh, um, I think the answer was no. Till, till we have some, I mean, well, it's, it's not yes, right? I mean, why would we say yes? <laughs> so I would say in software, our, our history with DRM is, it's a spectacular failure, right? I mean, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, a Apple investing all this money and this is nonsense. Now, I don't, I don't deal in pirated stuff. I pay the $1 or whatever it is, right? Because uh, philosophically, I don't, but... It's just crap, right? I mean, so in the in the hardware world, there's no reason, in my view, to be confident. They haven't actually produced anything, right? And and the and the uh, danger is, I mean, I know that we we live in the dark quite a bit with regards to what's actually going on uh, with attackers and things like that. But in the hardware world, we're really in the dark. I mean, there's nothing that we know, right? And and there are foreign governments who can be heavily invested in compromising uh, computer hardware. And the payoff is huge. So, I mean, that's, uh, again, preaching to the choir thing and being paranoid and things like that. But once I got into this, this kind of research, finding out what the status of a hardware security is gives me no confidence. That's right. Thank you. <laughs>